Good evening all. I, Princey, on behalf of Department of Forensic Science and Criminal Investigation, Digir Desire, welcome you all to India's first virtual forensic science week, 2020. This week is full of fun activities and knowledgeable session scheduled from 26th October to 1st November. On today's session, we'll be talking about fire investigation and for this session, we have with us Mr. John Rettini. Sir so John Rettini is one of a handful of people who have been certified to conduct both fire science, fire screen investigation, and fire debris analysis. He has personally conducted more than 2,000 fire scene inspections and has appeared as an expert witness on more than 200 occasions. He is an active proponent of standard for fire and other forensic investigation. He is a member of NFPA committee on fire investigation professional qualifications and has served three terms as chair of ASTM committee E30 on forensic science. He is a member of NIST OSAC subcommittee on fire explosions investigation and served on several scientific adversary panels. Sir John is a past chairperson of American Academy of Forensic Science Criminalistic Department. He received the Society of Fire Protection Engineers 2015 Person of the Year Award in recognition of his work in moving the fire investigation profession forward and in helping to prevent or reserve miscarriage of justice and arson cases. He is now an independent consultant living in Florida, he's and doing business as fi scientific fire analyst. His book, Scientific Protocol for Fire Investigation, now in its third edition, was published by CRC Press in 2018. I welcome you, sir, for our session. Over to you, sir. Good evening, and thank you for having me in this Forensic Science Week. I think the reason that I was asked to speak is because I'm old. I've been around a long time, and I have watched the field of fire investigation progress from witchcraft to science uh, over the last 45 years. And I thought that the best thing for me to do would be to uh, go over the history uh, that I participated in and give the audience an understanding of how the fire investigation profession has evolved. Can we have the next slide? So we have to have learning objectives on every presentation these days. And after watching this presentation, I hope that attendees will understand the history of fire investigation in the United States the mythology that plagued our profession for many years and the origin and development of standards for fire investigation. Now the next slide, please. This is on a coffee mug that a friend gave me, defining fire investigation as an intangible science of obscure suppositions based on ambiguous figures taken from un uncertain experiments of undetermined accuracy by people of debatable reliability and dubious mentality. It is, uh, it is an interesting field. Let me see the next slide, please. So one of the more important developments in fire investigation happened in 1984, although people didn't really recognize it until uh, about 10 years later. It was the release by the National Fire Protection Association of a film called Countdown to Disaster, which shows how flashover occurs. So the next slide I have is a short video. Uh, Initially, the burning cigarette creates a smoldering fire, which breaks down the foam stuffing into vaporous fuel. When there's enough heat and oxygen, it starts to flame. More heat produces more fuel, and the fire accelerates rapidly. Smoke and other products of the fire, including un 
burnt fuel collect beneath the ceiling. Within three minutes, the temperature at the ceiling reaches 1,000 degrees, heating the contents of the entire room near the point of ignition. The carpet and other furnishings start to break down into vaporous fuels. Then, within seconds, in a process called flashover, everything in the room erupts into flame. No life survives flashover. After all the oxygen in the room is consumed, a pulsing backdraft sucks in air from the outside, depletes it in a surge of burning, then breathes in more. This took place in less than four minutes and started with a smoldering cigarette. So that particular film helped to get rid of the myth that we had about low burning. It was said that fire burns upward and outward and it won't burn downward without help. And by help was meant an accelerant, a liquid accelerant on the floor. What we learned from this video, uh, later than we should have, is that low burning is not uh, an indicator of an accelerated fire or a fire involving flammable liquids. But we had plenty of myths uh, prior to uh, the adoption of NFPA 921, which I'll talk about in a minute, but can we have the next slide now? Before 1992, we had literally dozens of myths about how to interpret damage in fire investigations. Uh, let me see the next slide, please. The United States Department of Justice did a survey in 1977 of fire investigators and asked them what they used to uh, determine whether a fire was accidental or incendiary. Mm. And okay. those myths were collected um, and promulgated by, in a fire investigation handbook. The original survey said that a lot of the uh, indicators of arson were not scientifically tested. And it suggested that these items be tested um, to see if they were real, to see whether they meant anything. And unfortunately, the tests weren't run. But three years later, all of those myths were compiled by the US Department of Commerce, National Bureau of Standards, which is one of the uh, most widely respected science and engineering bodies on the planet. And when they wrote it down, all of the myths and legends became incorporated into our practice. Uh, and many textbooks on fire investigation actually uh, referred people back to this document in promulgating the myths. Next slide. One of the first myths was the alligatoring effect. Next slide. The alligatoring effect describes the appearance of char blisters. When wood burns, it chars and it makes char blisters. And the myth said that if you have bright, shiny, large uh, char blisters, then it was an accelerated fire. Next slide. This is a stairway that got burned in a uh, multiple fatality fire in um, North Carolina. And you can see these stairs have got shiny char blisters on them. 
And so based on that, the local fire investigator declared that somebody must have poured flammable liquid up and down the stairs. He also had another uh, myth in his toolbox. Uh, next slide. All right, next slide. This is um, the photograph that debunked the shiny versus uh, dull, large versus small alligatoring uh, myth. We have this wood is exposed to the same fire and yet you have all kinds of different uh, appearances of the char. This was Monty McGill's photo in, uh, published in 1983. I have a similar one, next slide, from my, uh, one of my own investigations. And again, you can see there are shiny blisters, there are dull blisters, there are flat blisters, there are curved blisters. Uh, next slide. So it turns out that the alligatoring effect doesn't mean anything other than that the wood got hot and burned. We had another myth called crazed glass. And this was written up in the uh, fire investigation handbook. And the myth was that glass only crazes if it's very rapidly heated. Well, I did some experiments on that back in the early 90s. And I found that it didn't matter how fast or how slow glass was heated up. Uh, it only crazed when hot glass was sprayed with cold water. So any fire is likely to produce crazed glass as long as the fire department responds with water. This was just totally something that people made up. Uh, I don't think they did it out of malice, but people were very anxious to find arson. Next slide. So I did a study and I published it in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 1992. Um, but even so, people kept on referring to it for several more years until it was debunked in uh, NFPA 921. Next slide. This is a very common uh, myth. People think that if there's uh, sharp, continuous, irregular lines of demarcation between burned and unburned areas, why it must have been a uh, flammable liquid burning on the floor. And in this case, in this photograph, there is actually a uh, flammable liquid burning on the floor. The carpet is the only thing that burned. So fire investigators who saw this, they extrapolated it to fires that had burned much more severely than this one, as shown uh, in the next slide. Oh, this was another uh, line of demarcation uh, you'll see this in a lot of textbooks where they talk about the sharp line between the charred wood um, on the right here would, would indicate uh, a rapidly developing fire, whereas the wood on the left would indicate a slowly developing fire. There is another textbook that has the same thing in it. Next slide. Again, it's a drawing. I have not seen a photograph, and you will not find a photograph uh, like this comparing a rapidly burning fire versus a slowly developing fire. It's something that people just sort of made up. I'm not sure where it came from, but let's look at the next slide. Here is a test fire that I participated in in 1992, and it shows uh, sharp, continuous, irregular lines of demarcation between the burned and unburned areas. There was not a drop of accelerant used in this fire. The unburned areas are where the carpet shrank back and protected the floor, and the burned areas are where the floor was exposed. Not a drop of accelerant. Next slide. Here is a trail that I created uh, simply by putting clothing on the floor and then making a path through the clothing. And when the room went to flashover, it burned the linoleum down the middle, but it was protected on either side. 
And this looked like uh, a fire that I had investigated, another multiple fatality fire uh, shown in the next slide. This was interpreted as gasoline burning on the floor. Uh, it means nothing of the sort, but back in the early 90s, this was the interpretation that was applied to uh, this particular fire. Um, and it, it resulted in a, a gentleman being uh, accused of killing six people. But fortunately, we ran a test fire and were able to, um, well, we, we, I was working for the prosecution. We were trying to put this guy away. Um, and when we ran the test fire, we learned that you can get this kind of damage to the floor without a drop of accelerant. Next slide. This was a pattern that I generated uh, in response to seeing a similar one in a fire report where the investigator said, there's a puddle on the floor, must have been a flammable liquid. Even though the samples came out negative, the laboratory did not find anything. And I made this pattern by taking a cardboard box and lighting it on fire and just letting it burn. And it generated radiant heat and it made this pattern. Next slide. There was a uh, individual named Dr. Tony Patorti who did a uh, experiment trying to see what characteristics flammable liquids caused in fire patterns. Next slide. And this is a fire with one liter of gasoline poured on a uh, oak parquet floor. As you can see, it looked nothing like the slide that we showed you earlier. Next slide. Spalling of concrete. This was the same guy that uh, determined that there was gasoline poured down the stairway uh, because of the alligators. He saw spalling of concrete on the floor, but he called it spalding. And he said that was an indication of flammable liquid burning on the floor. It doesn't happen. You can't make concrete spall with a flammable liquid. You can do it with uh, burning wood, but not with burning flammable liquid because the flammable liquid actually protects the surface of the concrete underneath it as long as it's there. Next slide. And this is a photograph that actually proves that spalling doesn't really mean much because this is on a ceiling and we know for sure that there wasn't a puddle of liquid sitting on the ceiling. Next slide. People also uh, looked at melted metals and you can determine how hot uh, a fire got if you have melted copper, for example, you know it got to about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so if we run test fires though, we find that this standard time temperature curve is actually a prescription for how to run a test. It's not a prescription for how a fire behaves. The next slide shows some real fires. And all of those uh, exceeded the standard time temperature curve. And yet I've seen people accused of setting fires because the fire exceeded the standard time temperature curve. Next slide shows uh, 2000 degrees. And the next slide shows uh, the standard time temperature curve. And you can see that every single one of these test fires exceeded the standard time temperature curve. So that particular uh, myth uh, is now put to rest. But for a lot of years, people thought, and they wrote in textbooks that if it exceeded the standard time temperature curve, then um, it must have been accelerated. Next slide. So NFPA 921, Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations, first came out in 1992. It was uh, the, the technical committee was commissioned in 1985 and it took them seven years to put this, uh, this out. Next slide. It debunked many of the myths and it had lots of paragraphs entitled misconceptions about char, misconceptions about spalling, misconceptions about V patterns. And to say that it was not widely embraced by the fire investigation community would be uh, a big understatement. Next slide. 
Nice hypothesis you have here. It would be a shame if someone were to test it. This is uh, Dr. Carl Sagan, one of my heroes. Um, NFPA 921 brought the concept of applying the scientific method to fire investigations pretty much for the first time. Next slide. And this is how the average fire investigator in the US responded. Uh, their heads exploded. They couldn't believe that the National Fire Protection Association would be telling them uh, that they've been doing it wrong. And many of these guys, you know, with 20 or 30 years experience, they've been doing it wrong. And they had sent people to prison for uh, setting fires that were actually accidents. Next slide. In 1993, the US Supreme Court came down with a decision about the admission of expert testimony in uh, American trials. It was called Daubert. And it is a very uh, important decision and it tries to help judges decide whether the expert testimony is reliable or not. Next slide. During the first few editions, first three editions of NFPA 921, um, it stated a fire or explosion is a complex endeavor uh, involving both art and science. And the art, I thought, just meant luck. But next slide, we fixed it. it I was on the, the committee at the time. And we can see that over, over the years, uh, art has become less important and science has become more important. Next slide. This is a quote from Learned Hand. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. Next slide. The problem with confidence, the problem is that confidence doesn't correlate with performance. In fact, most of us know people who are confident despite their lack of skill. This is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. You can be confident to the point of delusion, but if you don't have the skills to back it up, you end up looking like an idiot at best and arrogant at worst. Similarly, competence doesn't correlate with confidence. In fact, people who are skilled are often less confident mistakenly believing that the, their skill level is average at best and that others are as good as they are, if not better. And the next slide. This shows the correlation between confidence and competence. Uh, people who know nothing will admit it, but people who know a little bit can be very confident. And then as time goes by and they gain experience, their co confidence will drop until they become experts and it goes back up. This is very, very common in uh, fire investigation. The trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. That's Bertrand Russell. Next slide. You can't convince a believer of anything for their belief is not based on evidence, it's based on a deep-seated need to believe. Uh, NFPA 921 had a very hard time catching on in its first few editions, but the committee persevered. Next slide. In 1994, the IAAI, International Association of Arson Investigators Forensic Science Committee uh, became concerned with courts allowing unconfirmed canine alerts into evidence. Um, next slide. So people would get on the witness stand and talk about what their dog said. Next slide. So dogs can't be cross-examined and we can't ask them, well, did you smell gasoline, which doesn't belong there? Or did you smell lamp oil, which might belong there? They cannot be cross-examined and they frequently make errors. It, they're a very, very good tool for uh, locating samples with a higher probability of testing positive in the lab. But just having this uh, Labrador retriever uh, alert 
doesn't mean there's flammable liquids there. You really need a laboratory analysis. Next slide. In 1994, the first Daubert exclusion of a fire investigator uh, happened. Uh, he was not able to articulate the scientific method. And this is uh, the first time that Daubert was applied to fire investigation. Next slide. People began to complain about NFPA 921. This National Fire and Arson Report was an in-house uh, publication of an insurance company and was the scene of a lot of debate about whether NFPA 921 was a worthy document. Next slide. And we continued, they had uh, a member of the committee versus a lawyer who didn't like NFPA 921. Uh, debating. This is 95. Next slide. The Technical Committee on Fire Investigation in 1995 convened two special meetings to discuss the problem of unconfirmed canine alerts. Uh, next slide. Hello. Next. Okay. They issued what's called a tentative interim amendment to NFPA 921. Uh, it was an emergency declaration. Too many courts had started admitting the testimony of dog handlers when they shouldn't have. Um, and so the committee uh, issued this emergency declaration in 1996, uh, warning people that unconfirmed canine alerts don't belong in court. Next slide. What the committee stated was that the emergency was occasioned by the committee's recognition that certain courts have premised their decision on the basis of unreliable evidence and testimony. Next slide. And it said evidence and testimony relied upon by our nation's courts have been empirically proven to be false. In essence, a fraud is being perpetrated upon the judicial system. Next slide. So the fighting continues in the National Fire and Arson Report about uh, NFPA 921. And they finally started encouraging people to participate in the process. Next slide. When people say about NFPA 921, it's only a guide, that means almost certainly that they have not followed its guidance. Next slide. In 1997, uh, we had another uh, canine case where the Georgia Supreme Court overturned a conviction uh, stating that unconfirmed canine alerts are not reliable evidence. And the court uh, referred to the first lie detector test and likened unconfirmed canine alerts to that. And this is a, an old Indian uh, tradition where you would go into a tent with, uh, with no lights, but a donkey inside the tent and you touch the donkey's tail. And if the donkey brayed, you were lying. And if the donkey remained quiet, you were not. Uh, not, not a terribly reliable lie detector test. Next slide. So in, uh, in the Benfield case, the court, one of our courts said uh, that if you're going to tell yourself, if you're going to sell yourself as a scientist, you better follow uh, the scientific method. But they allowed uh, firemen who had no scientific training to testify based on their experience. And this resulted in insurance defense lawyers and prosecutors uh, counseling against referring to science in your investigation report and testimony. Uh, that was uh, Fortunately, a brief period of time because uh, in 1999, in the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, 1998, we replaced uh, paragraphs entitled Misconceptions About 
uh, with paragraphs entitled interpretation of so that we didn't look like we were disrespecting the fire investigation profession by suggesting they held misconceptions. Next slide. This was the uh, Supreme Court rejection of the proposition that less scientific evidence should get less scrutiny. Uh, they unanimously rejected the, uh, the IAAI's proposition that uh, because fire investigation was less scientific, it should get less scrutiny. And the court said, no, the opposite is true. Next slide. In 2000, uh, a lot of things came together to make the fire investigation profession move forward. Next slide. Uh, the International Association of Arson Investigators endorsed NFPA 921 for the first time, and this is going into it now its fourth edition. Um, also, uh, next slide. The uh, president of the IAAI said it's time for the IAAI to stop looking in the rearview mirror and start looking out the windshield. Next slide. The United States Department of Justice also endorsed the use of NFPA 921. Next slide. This was a book that was put together by a uh, committee of about 20 fire investigators and scientists called Fire and Arson Scene Evidence, a Guide for Public Safety Personnel. Next slide. It said, as Sherlock Holmes pointed out, many types of investigations are susceptible to prejudgment, but few as often as fire scene investigations. So a lot of times people just made up their mind before they even looked at the, at the evidence that it was a set fire. Next slide. And they said that NFPA 921 has become a benchmark for the training and expertise of everyone who purports to be an expert. So this is 20 years ago. Um, we couldn't use the word standard. People didn't like the, the concept of saying that there was a standard for fire investigation. So we called it a benchmark, which means a standard. Next slide. The uh, 2001 edition of NFPA 921 came out, and this was the uh, edition that removed the reference to art in fire investigation. Next slide. The definition was changed. A fire investigation is a complex endeavor involving skill, technology, knowledge, and science. Next slide. In 2001, the process of elimination section was added to allow open flame determination when the origin was clearly defined. And this was to allow the uh, fire investigator to say, yep, this is an arson fire because I can absolutely eliminate everything else. But we had a problem. Uh, the next slide shows what we meant by a clearly defined origin. And this is a a fire that began in a wardrobe. There are no uh, potential sources of ignition inside that clearly defined origin. And in this situation, a fire investigator would be allowed to say, somebody must have lit this with an open flame. Next slide. But the fire investigation profession uh, took liberties with the, the term clearly defined. Uh, in 2004, uh, Mari Posley, uh, an edit, uh, reporter for the Chicago Tribune, uh, was studying uh, fire investigation. And this particular series on forensic science in general and arson in particular got a lot of attention in the fire investigation community. Next slide. 2004 was a year that uh, Ernest Willis was uh, released from death row when it was determined that the fire that he was convicted of setting was actually an accident and that all of the evidence that fire investigators relied upon to convict him was baloney. Uh, 
Next slide. That same year though, uh, Cameron Todd Willingham was executed by lethal injection in Texas. Uh, he had the same kind of evidence that uh, Mr. Willis had against him, but a different court, a different prosecutor. And um, he is still famous in the fire investigation world. And um, he, has, he has accomplished quite a bit more after his death than before. Next slide. 2005 was a watershed year for origin accuracy. Uh, the fire investigators core competence is determining where the fire started, reading those fire patterns and trying to figure out where the fire started. Next slide. This is a ATF agent uh, standing outside a test cell in 2005. The ATF, our Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, which is a premier organization in our federal system for investigating fires, they had been running experiments for years um, at their training academy and asking people if they could determine the origin of the fire. And they were generally not able to, they would be like 10% accurate. So they brought this test out to a meeting of fire investigators in Las Vegas in 2005. Next slide. And they burned these buildings for two minutes beyond flashover. And they asked 53 investigators to examine the scene and indicate in which quadrant they thought the fire originated. Now think about it with, uh, you just have to pick the quadrant. You got a one in four chance of picking it just by accident or just at random. Next slide. This is what they were asked. Where do you think the fire started? Next slide. And most investigators thought that the fire started in the upper right quadrant. Next slide. The reason they thought that was this was the lowest and deepest char. This was the heaviest damage anywhere in the compartment. Next slide. The fire actually started in the upper left and it's still left behind. Uh, the next slide a fire pattern that looked like it was caused by a plume. So this is the real origin of the fire, but fire investigators were misled by that extra large burn pattern just opposite the doorway. Next slide. Of the 53 people asked to determine the quadrant, only three got it right. And the experiment was repeated with another uh, room just like it, and a different three people got it right. So this is not a, uh, a blessing on the uh, ability of fire investigators to determine where a fire really started. Next slide. So yeah, the same results were obtained. Uh, next slide. 2006 was the first fire investigation text that was printed in full color and that was mine. Next slide. The Innocence Project <clears throat> took an interest in uh, wrongful arson convictions. And uh, I was contacted by uh, the director of the Innocence Project and asked to look at the Willis and Willingham cases. Next slide. And what I did was I got four other colleagues to um, review the testimony with me and we produced this report uh, on the two cases, the Willingham and the Willis cases. And that was in 2006. Next slide. The report formed the basis of a complaint filed with the uh, newly formed Texas Forensic Science Commission. Next slide. The 2005 experiment that we talked about where three out of 53 got it right uh, was repeated in Oklahoma City in 2007. Next slide. <clears throat> there were three fires with 70 investigators uh, participating in the experiment. Next slide. There were three fires that they were asked to determine the quadrant. The first fire, 
uh, was extinguished 30 seconds after flashover. The second fire was extinguished 70 seconds after flashover. And a third fire was extinguished three minutes after flashover. And here are the results. Next slide. Fire number one, there were 70 people picked a quadrant. 59 got it correct. It's 84%. And this is in a 30 seconds after flashover. Next slide. 70 seconds after flashover, uh, six investigators had the good sense not to determine the origin. Um, of the 64 who did, 44% got the origin correct. Um, that's not so great. And fire number three, 17 people had the good sense not to uh, opine on the origin. And 13 out of 53 got it correct. So this is slightly better than the three out of 53 that got it correct in 2005, but it's still 25%, which is, next slide. Here's, here's the, uh, the percent correct versus the time that the fire burned. And you can see that it looks like a straight line heading down to zero, but it got down to 25%. Next slide. So that would be uh, the equivalent of two coin tosses to determine where the fire started. Next slide. So Steve Carman presented his um, origin accuracy results from 2005 uh, after he retired um, from ATF <clears throat> in 2008. And people, people went crazy when they saw this. Next slide. NFPA 921 uh, got more scientific uh, in the 2008 edition uh, where they applied the scientific method to origin determination. Next slide. This is the question that was asked, is there a competent ignition source at the hypothetical origin? The lack of a competent ignition source at the hypothesized origin should make the hypothesis subject to increased scrutiny. People were beginning to come become aware that sometimes fire investigators got the wrong origin and that usually leads to the wrong cause. Next slide. Is the growth and development of a fire starting at the hypothetical origin consistent with available data and specific points in time? Few data are more damaging to an origin hypothesis than a contradictory observation by a credible eyewitness. Next slide. 2009 was a big year because NFPA 1033 uh, was changed uh, to include the list of 13, and that is uh, 13 subject matter areas that fire investigators were required to have knowledge of. Next slide. And these are the uh, 13, uh, most people are familiar with them. We're working on reorganizing this list. Uh, next slide. 2009 was also the year that the uh, National Research Council published Strengthening Forensic Science in the United States, A Path Forward. And it took to task just about every forensic science discipline there is. Uh, including fire investigation. The only discipline that um, the National Research Council report uh, thought was uh, worthy of having being called a forensic science was DNA. So it did discuss fires as follows. Next slide. The scientific foundations exist to support the analysis of explosions because such analysis is based primarily on well-established chemistry. As part of the laboratory work, an analyst will try to reconstruct the bomb which introduces procedural complications, but not scientific ones. Next slide. It also said, by contrast, much more research is needed on the natural variability of burn patterns and damage characteristics and how they are affected by the presence of various accelerants. 
Despite the paucity of research, some arson investigators continue to make determinations about whether or not a particular fire was set. However, according to testimony presented to the committee, I was the guy presenting the testimony, many of the rules of thumb that are typically assumed to indicate that an accelerant was used, uh, e.g. alligatoring of wood, specific char patterns, have been shown not to be true. Next slide. Experiments should be designed to put arson investigations on a more solid scientific footing. And when I saw that in the report, I thought, next slide. The same thing was said 40 years earlier. A program of carefully planned scientific experiments should be conducted to establish the reliability of currently used burn indicators. So we're hoping to, that, that we can do the experiments this time. Um, also that year, Dr. Craig Byler was appointed by the ten, for in, Texas Forensic Science Commission to um, critique the science in the Willingham case. Uh, Trial by Fire was published by David Grand in the New Yorker. And just as the Forensic Science Committee was getting ready to hear the report of Dr. Byler, um, Governor Rick Perry replaced the chairman and two other members of the Forensic Science Committee, delaying their work for another couple of years. Uh, Governor Perry was running for president that year and certainly didn't want anyone to think that he had been governor when uh, an innocent man was executed, but that's what happened. Next slide. Some of the experiments that help us understand how fire investigation got off the track were run in 2009 by Underwriters Laboratories, which is a major research organization in the United States, uh, working mainly for insurance companies and fire departments. Next slide. What they found was that in a modern room can become close to flashover in three minutes, whereas a legacy room where the furnishings are made of wood and cotton and cloth uh, burn much more slowly. And this explains why back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, people didn't know about flashover because it didn't happen that much. Uh, we, we just decided to put uh, polyurethane foam inside our, our uh, residences and makes it, the, that fuel makes it much more dangerous. Next slide. So the 20, 2007 accuracy experiments were reported uh, at a meeting of the California Conference of Arson Investigators, uh, never published, never published, but it did the same, uh, it reached the same conclusion, and that is that fire investigators are not very good at determining the origin of a fire if it's burned for more than two minutes. Next slide. There was a posthumous court of inquiry held in Texas. Uh, and I went and testified uh, in front of Charlie Baird with a number of other uh, fire experts. But the state of Texas objected to the court of inquiry and they got the appeals court to prevent uh, Judge Baird from rendering his decision, which is shown in the next slide. This court orders the exoneration of Cameron Todd Willingham for murdering his three daughters in light of the overwhelming credible and reliable evidence presented by the petitioners. This court holds that the state of Texas wrongfully executed Cameron Todd Willingham. So the judge had written this uh, decision but was never allowed to hit the send button on his email. Next slide. In 2010, there was uh, also uh, another study of the Willingham case, and this was the National Institute of Justice. It's the research arm of our Justice Department called Rising from the Ashes. What have we learned from the Cameron Todd Willingham case? Next slide. Fire investigators began to feel the sting of the list of 13 uh, subject matter areas that a fire investigator is required to know and what happened was depositions where the investigators put under oath and asked some hard questions. Next slide. Like this one, 
this guy's got 30 years experience and he doesn't know what the basic units of energy are. He says, uh, endothermic and exothermic. I don't recall. Would the basic units of energy be described or referred to as joules? He doesn't know. Fire investigators really ought to understand the concepts of energy. Next slide. He asked him, what is a watt? He said, I don't know. Is it one joule per second? That's the correct answer. He says, I don't know. How is this possible? Next slide. The Texas Forensic Science Commission, based on the case that had now been in its, uh, on its desk for five years, uh, may, issued 17 recommendations for arson cases. It did not comment specifically on the Willingham case, but it meant to. Uh, the, they were pre prevented from uh, commenting to specifically on the case. This is a film uh, that came out in 2011 after that court of inquiry. Uh, it's worth looking at if you can find it. Um, I think it might still be available on iTunes. Next slide. 921, we had the 2014 edition and the chapter on cause determination was re rewritten to conform to the scientific method, just as the chapter on origin determination had been previously uh, rewritten. Next slide. Again, uh, recognize a need, define the problem, collect data, uh, analyze data, develop cause hypotheses, test the hypotheses. Next slide. We had clearly defined origin in NFPA 921 for 10 years, but because the phrase was not itself defined, fire investigators took liberties and they would say, well, the origin is clearly defined to me. And what we had really meant was it should be clearly defined to anyone who's not uh, properly trained. But uh, there is this doctrine of negative corpus, which means if I can't find an accidental cause, then I'm going to call this fire arson. Um, and it was disparaged in, uh, in NFPA 921. Next slide. And this is what it said. It said, this process is not consistent with the scientific method, is inappropriate, and should not be used because it generates untestable hypotheses and may result in incorrect determinations of the ignition source and the first fuel ignited. Next slide. This is the fire investigation profession going nuts about that disparagement of negative corpus being placed into the document. Next slide. Another experiment on origin determination accuracy, and this was done with, uh, with photographs, not with uh, people actually visiting the scene, but, and, and people volunteered to take this. So we had 587 uh, self-selected fire investigators. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. <coughs> Next slide. Here we go. Working independently, they viewed photos and data from a fire that burned for only one minute beyond flashover. Next slide. The error rate was 22 to 26%, which is consistent with the error rate in the, uh, in the 2007 tests. Next slide. To date, and I mean to this date, 2020, there have been no studies of origin accuracy that demonstrate that origin can be determined any more precisely then the room, if a fire burns fully involved for more than three minutes. Next slide. This was 2012. Uh, we had uh, David Gavitt, who was released from custody after 27 years. He had been convicted based on some really flawed uh, chemical analysis and some really flawed uh, fire pattern analysis. Uh, so David was Finally out after 27 years. Next slide. As a result, uh, his lawyers, Caitlin Plummer and in Imran Saeed, uh, published a paper on shifted science and what should happen? What should the courts be doing when the science changes as it has in fire investigation? Next slide. 
the Canine Accelerant Detection Association came out and disparaged the uh, introduction of unconfirmed canine alerts. So these are the people that are um, actually involved in training and certifying accelerant detection canines saying they shouldn't be used. Now, if you remember, we go all the way back to 1996 where the uh, NFPA 921 said that unconfirmed alerts don't constitute reliable evidence. And this is 2012, so we're you know, 16 year, years after that first declaration, still fighting that fight. Next slide. They said, our position is that no prosecutor, attorney, or accelerant detection canine handler should ever testify or encourage testimony that an ignitable liquid is present without confirmation through laboratory analysis. There are still people trying to introduce unconfirmed canine alerts, but this document um, gets in their way. Next slide. The International Association of Arson Investigators came out in 2013 and declared that NFPA 921 was an authoritative text. And they print this um, position statement in every copy of the quarterly uh, journal, the Fire and Arson Investigator. It's on the, on the first page of, of every uh, quarterly uh, journal. 2013, uh, Texas reorganized its uh, fire marshal's office. Uh, they appointed a brilliant man named Chris Keneally, and he set up a science advisory work group to review other uh, cases that may have involved bad science um, by the Texas fire marshals. Next slide. 2013, Andrew Cox from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms published Origin Matrix Analysis, which showed that once a fire burns beyond flashover, it becomes really difficult to pinpoint the origin. I think there's a picture of it. Next slide. And what, what we've got here is four different origins in the top row. And what the damage would look like at flashover, what the damage would look like in short duration, flashover, post flashover, and long duration post flashover. And the thing to compare is the top row, which has four different origins with the bottom row where the damage all looks alike. This is why it's so hard to determine an origin in a fully, fully involved compartment the damage is going to match where the oxygen is and not necessarily where the fire has burned the longest. Next slide. Um, I have a duplicate. This is the, um, the bottom line, damages that cannot be attributed to post flashover ventilation induced exposures must be systematically evaluated in any credible origin analysis. And this means that uh, the ventilation is the most important thing to consider when you're looking at a fire that burned for more than three minutes fully involved. Next slide. 2013, uh, Joseph Awe, in Wisconsin was released from prison because of the new language disparaging negative corpus in NFPA 921. He had been convicted based on uh, negative corpus reasoning and the fire investigators admitted that during his trial, uh, which I think was in 2006, before the uh, language disparaging negative corpus was adopted. So the judge found this to be new evidence. And next slide. He wrote, this is not the fault of the state's arson investigators who were trained in the flawed methodology. It is the result of the maturation of the arson investigation field, a gradual process of taking a second look at the negative corpus thinking. Next slide. 
This is uh, Mr. Aum meeting his granddaughter for the first time because he had been in prison when she was born. Uh, and this, this picture always reminds me of how important the work we do is. Um, after the, after Mr. All was released from prison, he turned around and sued the fire investigators who uh, wrongfully declared that his fire was intentionally set. In fact, it was an accident. Um, so, and he also sued the electrical engineer who failed to notice the real cause of the fire. And finally got some justice, but it took a while. Next slide. Twenty fourteen, uh, Terry Don Hewitt and Wayne McKenna wrote an article called "A Perfect Storm Brewing for Fire Investigators in Court." Next slide. And that was because reliability challenges to fire investigator testimony were becoming very, very common. Um, we don't have product liability fire cases without uh, some kind of reliability challenge. It's, it's almost routine. Uh, there's a growing alarm about wrongful convictions as more and more people convicted of arson were determined to be innocent. And then NFPA 921 and NFPA 1033 um, had the same um, publication date of 2014. And so they, they became much more closely uh, aligned. Next slide. Han Tak Lee, who had been in custody for 23 years, uh, was released um, as a result of uh, the hard work that, that Peter Goldberger did. And I spent 21 years on the case uh, working for Mr. Lee. I didn't learn about his conviction until you know, two years after it happened. And I volunteered to work with, with his defense team. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty big decision and it got a lot of publicity in the United States. Next slide. This is the, uh, what I call poetic justice. Um, Judge Martin Carlson wrote this uh, beginning, this introduction to his finding releasing Mr. Lee. Slow and painful has been man's progress from magic to law. Sometimes with the benefit of insight gained over time, we learn that what was once regarded as truth is myth and what was once accepted as science is superstition. So it is with this case. And he proceeded to look at evidence, which is unusual in in an appeal in the United States, they, they mainly look at process, but he did look at the evidence and uh, the next slide shows some of his uh, insights. The guy that said that this was an arson fire did it by calculating things. Um, he, he did not explain and no evidence was, um, was presented how Lee could have managed to find and use a vessel large enough to hold more than 60 gallons of gasoline and heating fuel. And this is, that was Aston's testimony that he thought that there were 60 gallons of uh, flammable liquid uh, mixture of gasoline and heating fuel used to set the fire. It was totally made up. The laboratory did not back it up. Next slide. Next slide. What do we do? There have been a chemical trace of its existence. Next slide. 
So he said that he had, uh, Mr. Aston testified that in his 20 year career, he had um, investigated 15,000 fires. And I saw that right away when I read his testimony, but a lot of people didn't see it. And the judge uh, figured out that Aston would have had to have averaged one fire cause determination per day for more than 41 years, working seven days a week and 365 days each year. We have a problem in the fire investigation profession and that some people are mathematically challenged. It's just not possible to do 15,000 fire investigations in a career. Uh, next slide. When, uh, when I started working on the Hantock leak case, my son was 10 years old and 21 years later, uh, he sent me this uh, dead windmill award because neither he nor I thought that Mr. Lee was ever gonna get out of jail. Next slide. NFPA 1033 adds three more topics to the list of required knowledge. And that's shown on the next slide. Fire protection systems, electricity and electrical systems, evidence collection and documentation. Next slide. This is the 2014 edition. It softened the tone on the process of elimination, but it kept the disparaging words about negative corpus. Next slide. In 2014, the Organization of Scientific Area Committees was founded. This was in response to the 2009 report. Uh, so it only took five years. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a successor to the National Bureau of Standards and the Department of Justice uh, formed these committees. Uh, there was a subcommittee on fire debris analysis and uh, fire and explosion investigation. Next slide. So doesn't this look like a, a fun organization? Um, typical government graph. Um, it shows uh, five different uh, main areas of concentration with the fire debris underneath the chemistry and instrumental analysis and fire scene and explosions underneath crime scene and death investigation. They have done a pretty decent job uh, in the the five or six years they've been uh, working. Next slide. They met for the first time in Norman, Oklahoma in the winter uh, in the United States. Uh, there have been a couple of meetings of government agencies uh, that were frowned upon for spending too much money and going to places where people like to be. So they chose Norman, Oklahoma where nobody wants to be in January. Next slide. The Texas State Fire Marshal's Office, the Science Advisory Work Group, um, wrote that Sonia Casey had been convicted using bad science and she was granted a certificate of actual innocence. Now she had been out, next slide. She had been out <clears throat> on parole since 1998 and it was very unusual um, because she never admitted that she set the fire, she never expressed remorse. And in the United States, such people don't get parole. So this was a, an, excep an, ex <clears throat> an exceptional case, but it took 17 years from the time she was released until she was declared actually innocent. Things work slowly. Next slide. In 2015, three men convicted in 1980 were exonerated in a case from Brooklyn. Next slide. Here's one of them, uh, one of his compadres died in prison and another one went blind in prison because he had untreated glaucoma. But he got out in uh, late 2015 and the prosecutor I think is quoted on the next slide. Uh, 
we concluded that these three men were wrongfully convicted based on weak circumstantial evidence, outdated science, and the testimony of a single wholly unreliable witness who recanted before her death. So uh, Ken Thompson said, even though we cannot give these men back the decades they spent in prison with one tragically dying behind bars, justice requires that we as prosecutors do the right thing and clear their names. Next slide. United Underwriters Laboratories started a uh, fire, fire safety research group and they convened a technical panel to study the effects of ventilation on structure fires. Next slide. And this is one of the main outputs of that research. The top chart shows the temperature and the bottom chart shows a concentration of oxygen. And what it does is it shows that when you reach flashover, the fire uses up all or almost all of the oxygen in the room. And the only place where there's any uh, oxygen tends to be at the floor. So the smoke comes out the top of the opening and fresh air comes in the bottom of the opening. And that creates low burning, something that we started talking about back in 1984. Next slide. Uh, this is another video. Uh, don't know if you can play it. Um, here we go. So this is a, an experiment done by now Dr. Uta Skoll, who lit a uh, dish of heptane, uh, flammable liquid, uh, C7, H16, it's a pure liquid, inside a steel box. And what he's got in this box is a, in the upper right, there's a slit to allow uh, the smoke and heat to exhaust. And in the lower right, there is a slit to allow air to come in. And you can see the flame is being pushed off of the uh, liquid by virtue of the fact that there's a, a wind blowing in from the lower right. And it's pushing the flame off of the liquid. But it's still hot in there. And the box is filling with unburned heptane and products of combustion, but where the liquid is, there is no more oxygen or the oxygen is getting very depleted. And what happens next is that the fire is going to migrate to the right. until the only place in the room in that box where there's any flame is not above the liquid. There's still liquid in that dish, but the flame is occurring right at the vent where the air comes in because that's the only place where there's sufficient oxygen to support a flame. It's uh, one of my favorite films. Could move to the next slide. So we had our second meeting uh, of the OSAC in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, turns out the meeting was in a, a, during a blizzard. So again, not a garden spot. Next slide. One of the things that the uh, OSAC is supposed to do is look at the standards of practice that are out there in the, the field and add them to a registry of approved standards. And that happened in 2016 when NFPA 921 and NFPA 1033 were the first approved standards. Next slide. There was a publication by the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Justice uh, on evaluation of forensic science literature, including the literature of fire investigation. Next slide. NFPA 921 entered its 10th revision cycle. And uh, just so people know, uh, the members of the technical committee uh, pay their own way to go to meetings. They, don't, they are not compensated in any way, except for this cake. And so the uh, NFPA gave the technical committee a nice cake. 
for making it to 10 editions. And the next slide shows that we ate it all up. Next slide. Uh, the 2017 edition came out in, uh, it incorporated some of the new knowledge from uh, the ventilation experiments and they changed the drawings that had been uh, the same since 1992. Uh, next slide. So from 1992 to 2014, the top drawing was used to illustrate post flashover burning. And in 2017, it was changed to show that the fire actually went out uh, where it originated. The chair on the left was the origin of this hypothetical fire. And unless there's oxygen, there is no burning. And this, uh, this comports with the, the experiment in the steel box uh, on a small scale. This is a large scale. Fire can go out at the origin, and that can result in more damage in places that are not the origin. And that can be problematic for determining the correct origin. Next slide. In 2017, the American Bar Association published a special issue on uh, the future of forensic science. And next slide, it included an article on what fire invest fire litigators need to know in 2017. And I was uh, privileged to be asked to write that article. Next slide. The American Academy for the Advancement of Science, uh, AAAS, they are the publishers of Science Magazine. Uh, they did a quality and gap analysis mm -hmm. on fire investigation. Uh, it's only one of two forensic sciences that they have addressed so far, the other one being fingerprints. Uh, it's worth looking at. Next slide. The third edition of my book was published in 2018. Next slide. And in 2020, the 10th edition of NFPA 921 was published. So that covers uh, a lot of years in uh, 45, 45 years and 45 minutes. This is my contact information. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. That's it. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful session. Your videos on the flashover and your images from the allegatory effect, they were very acknowledging. You very well cleared our understanding of the line of discrimination and uh, the growth of the fire with respect to different origins. You have also given us an insight on the journey of the fire investigation guidelines over the year. It was an honor to have you, sir. Thank you for sharing your experience in form of different case studies. It was really great to have you as a part of the forensic team. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm sorry for the technical glitches. I will learn to share my screen. <laughs> <laughs>